Hey everybody, today we're going to be analyzing a lunar module fuel tank system. So you can see I have it up on my screen right now, and essentially we're going to be recreating this analysis throughout the course of the video. So this video is going to be split up into three sections. The first section is going to be understanding the structure, how it works, um, and how we kind of approach the analysis. Uh, section two is going to be the CAD, what I did for CAD work, and we'll step through that. And then section three is going to be recreating what you see here on screen. So before we jump in the video, uh, two quick notes. The first thing is um, for CAD, I'm using Fusion 360, and for analysis, I'm using FEMAP with NXNASTRAN. So Fusion 360 is just about the best CAD program you can get for free. Autodesk has a license for hobbyists, so you can get that totally free, no strings attached. There are some features that you can't use, but generally it works totally fine. Um, and then FEMAP with NXNASTRAN is a very commonly used program in the aerospace industry, and they actually have an educational license that you can download as well. So both of these things, uh, if you want to follow along, I'll put a link in the description below to get the free license and you can follow along and learn. So uh, the other thing is, of course, I'm using these, you know, modern, uh, modern-ish. Uh, Nastran is pretty old, it's the finite element solver, um, but I'm using these modern-ish tools to uh, analyze, you know, Apollo program structures that were designed in the 60s. So, of course, they didn't have these tools as I'm using them. They did most of the stuff, if not all of it, by hand. Um, this is, you know, an exercise in doing modern analysis just with using historical structures as a reference. So just keep that in mind, of course. You know, they would have done these calculations by hand um, and all the drawings by hand and everything back in the 60s when this stuff was actually made. Okay, so let's jump into understanding the structure. I'll put timestamps in the description uh, and they should show up on the video if you just want to skip to the CAD or the analysis. Uh, but I recommend you, you stick around because I think understanding structures is uh, extremely important for analysts to be hands-on and very in tune with the hardware um, because at the end of the day, as an analyst, what you're trying to do is represent reality and you need to understand how the structure works in order to do that appropriately. So I have some pictures of the lunar module here. Now, if you've seen, you know, the regular in space on the moon pictures of the lunar lander, this might look a bit different. Um, so before we talk about the fuel tank, uh, this is probably... I have this set as my desktop wallpaper. It's the same one as the last video. But this probably looks much more familiar with what you're used to. Um, we're, we're particularly looking at the top portion up here, which is the ascent stage. Uh, this disconnects from the, the bottom gold foil part. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a very abstract shape with lots of panels that form kind of a complex shape. And... Uh, this, all that paneling is just thermal protection. Uh, it's not structural and they literally just, you know, covered this thing in geometric panels wherever they could to form the thermal protection system. So none of the, the stuff here that you see is structural. It's just how they chose to cover it uh, for, for thermal reasons. Um, and this is essentially what the structure of the lunar module looks like underneath uh, and here's another cool view that i found of the lunar module you can see um you know this cylindrical shape that you have right here uh where my mouse is and then you can see that same shape here um, and another cool thing here is the fuel tank um, i lost my pen here's the fuel tank that i'm going to be using as reference for our analysis um, and you can see they have like these panels that make up kind of that circle shape. Um, and then even 
Another thing that's cool is this strut you can see that runs from the front here to this point on the structure. Uh, you can actually see that poking through. So they didn't cover that with the, the thermal protection panels. They just let it go straight through. So it's kind of cool to see the, the underneath structure um, poking through the thermal panels and kind of get an idea for, for how this thing is blocked out and how it's covered. And of course, you can see the windows right here. Those, of course, are not covered. Um, and the same windows right here and right here. So hopefully that helps um, kind of demystify the, the lunar module. I know, you know, personally for myself, um, before I, I jumped into this kind of work that I'm doing with the, the lunar module, um, it, you know, the structure kind of looked very daunting. Like I didn't quite know what's going on here. There's a lot of shapes, but once you kind of jump in and understand it, you're like, okay, you know, underneath, like once you peel away all the thermal protection panels underneath, you have a structure that makes uh, a lot of sense. It's still, you know, fairly complex shapes and lots of struts, fuel tanks and whatnot, but you know, it, it makes much more sense. So anyways, I think that being said, we can jump into the fuel tank. Um, so I will say I, I did do a fair amount of searching and I, I couldn't find a ton of pictures on, um, the fuel tank system. These were the best two that I could find showing it here and here. Um, so this is the, uh, fuel tank you can see in this diagram right here. It's labeled Aerozine 90, um, which is a hypergolic fuel, uh, which means it, it burns on contact with an oxidizer. Um, I do have, I'll, I'll put a link to this in the description. I have, um, a, I found a source that goes through lots of historical, um, propulsion systems, particularly, you know, we have Saturn V, uh, stage two, Redstone rocket, Titan missile, um, Rocketdyne F1. Uh, so I, I particularly use this for, you know, pressure, what pressure this was done to, but, um, I believe it also says somewhere in here what the lunar module ascent engine. Um, but anyways, you can see here, the propellant supply was contained in two spherical titanium tanks. So, um, I'll, I'll put a link in this description. It's a, a cool website with lots of information. Um, but anyways, we have our, our fuel tank here. And on the other side, there is, um, a, an oxidizer tank, but we're just going to be looking at one of them. Um, so here we, we know we have spherical titanium tanks. And like I said, I, I couldn't find, um, you know, a ton of better pictures on the structure. Maybe if I scoured a bit longer, um, some, you know, better angles would come out, but, um, for now I have these, these two. So we have a tripod here and I'll explain what that means, um, in a moment, but, uh, we also have, you know, we can see fuel lines here. And then, uh, also we know I, there looks to be some other struts back here that are hidden by the fuel tank. So, um, essentially, you know, there's more than the tripod holding this up, but, uh, I couldn't find any great pictures of it. So, um, some of the structure I am sort of taking some liberties and designing what I think works well. Um, so th this isn't like a one, one to one, you know, this is what I guarantee the lunar module fuel tank structure was. Um, but it, it's kind of like a based on and inspired by what it looks like in the pictures and then you know some stuff that's hidden from us i i just took some liberties and designed what i thought would work well um same thing with uh you know the the tripod end here that i just circled this guy um i couldn't you know get great great zoomed in pictures of that so essentially i i went with their tripod constraints but um, again, just designed what I thought, uh, would, would work well as a, a reasonable tripod structure based on 
my experience with tripods um, and, and minimally constrained systems. So I, I guess that's the one kind of caveat to this video. Um, it's heavily inspired by the lunar module fuel tanks, but essentially I'm, you know, taking some liberties here and, and designing something that works, but might not be exactly the same. So uh, let's start with the fuel tank here. Um, so I'm not going to spend too long on this. Uh, so it's a titanium sphere. Um, so basically this is a thin walled uh, fuel tank. Um, I, again, I don't know exactly the wall thickness. Um, I think, what did I estimate? Um, I think I did 80 thousandths. So 0 0.08 inches. Uh, so there's a number of ways to make titanium tanks. Um, spin forming is one of them, um, where essentially you, you know, take a, a flat sheet and spin it and then use a tool to deform it into the shape. Um, so you can see it's like probably a half sphere. And then this is like a weld line. Um, I'm at least for this video, I'm going to abstract, uh, most of that away and just take it as a, a thin walled sphere. Um, and you can see, we also have some sort of end cap here where the struts attached. Uh, so I'll model that as a, a different thickness. Um, it's, it's hard to tell from the pictures, but it's either welded in or bolted in. Um, it looks like in this picture, there are rivets or bolts around the perimeter, but in this one, it's hard to tell. But um, for now, I'm just going to take this as a, a thin chilled sphere with, uh, on, on, you know, either end, there are end caps for strut supports. So, um, I, I did find, um, a paper on spin forming of titanium spheres. Um, I'll, uh, find that again and, and put it in the description if you're curious kind of what the process looks like. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly if that's the manufacturing method of the lunar module tanks. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still interesting to see how, um, you know, fuel tanks can be made. And then, uh, there's also, uh, nowadays you, you'll find what are called COPVs. So these are just titanium. Uh, it's, it's just the metal shell. Um, but a lot of days on modern rockets and, and fuel tanks and propulsion systems, um, what they'll do is it, COPV stands for carbon overwrapped pressure vessel. So they'll, they'll do a very, very thin titanium shell, like, you know, a quarter or less of, of this, um, just to like keep a, a sealed volume and then essentially wrap strands of carbon fiber around it. Um, and, and you can get a very, very lightweight tank, um, that is, uh, you know, just as stiff or if not stiffer. So, um, that's what a lot of fuel tanks today, like modern fuel tanks of this size, um, particularly, you know, helium tanks and whatnot, they're going to be, uh, much thinner titanium and then just wrapped in, in carbon fiber. So, um, anyways, that's the, that's the fuel tank. I, like I said, I don't want to spend a ton of time on you know, the, the nitty gritty details of, of just the fuel tank, um, kind of going for a whole systems approach here. Um, again, as always, maybe in the future, we'll, we'll kind of do a more dedicated model where we, you know, model the weld model, whatever this connection is here, um, and, and really kind of dive in and, and write some, some accurate structural margins for the fuel tank. But for, you know, this two to three hour video, we're just going to do a, a, a thin, thin shell sphere. So the other discussion topic, um, is the minimally constrained nature of the fuel tank. Um, so before we kind of jump into the details of the struts, um, if, if you don't know the, the kind of terminology minimally constrained. So let's imagine we have a cube see if I can draw a perspective 
drawing with a mouse, kind of. Um, so imagine you're holding this tube in your hand, this tube, <laughs> imagine you're holding this cube in your hand, um, and essentially, you know, your arm's outstretched, you're holding it. If you move your arm up, that's one degree of freedom. Um, if you move your arm left and right, that's two degrees of freedom. And if you move your arm forward and back, that's three degrees of freedom. So in a three-dimensional world, you your object has three directions that it can move three degrees of freedom is what it's called. Now, you can also not translate the object, right? Leave the center of the object in a fixed point and rotate the object. So, you know, you can rotate your hand forward and back, um, left and right, and then you can also twist the cube. So those are also three unique directions. So you can see you have um, six degrees of freedom. So any object in a three-dimensional world of which we happen to live has six degrees of freedom. Um, so when we say minimally constrained, um, we essentially mean that those six degrees of freedom are being exactly satisfied um, and no more, such that uh, if we like are attaching struts to this, which um, a strut is, you know, just one of these two force members. So like this is a strut right here. That's one strut. That's one strut. That's one strut. So there, that tripod is three struts. So um, essentially, if we attach a system of struts to this, if the object changes shape or grows, essentially, um, it is not over constrained. So the, 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 the object will not be fighting against the structure that mounts it. Um, if that's still a little bit confusing, I'll, I'll kind of dive in deeper here. So, um, we have our cube here, we know we have six degrees of freedom that need to be constrained. So let's look at a strut, right? So we know we have a point where the strut mounts on one end, and then we have the body of the strut and the point where it mounts on the other end. And sorry if my drawings aren't great, I am drawing with the mouse. Um, maybe in the future I'll upgrade to uh, a drawing pad. So essentially um, at either end, uh, we have either a ball joint or a rod end. So I have some pictures of those right here. So this is a rod end. Um, you can see you have threads here. So uh, this is a pretty easy way to make struts. Um, you, you have your tube goes here and you just have to have threads in here. And you literally just screw this guy in. Um, and then you have your rod end. So this is um, basically just a housing with a ball with a hole through it and um, essentially this um, I have a cross section of it right here so imagine if you cut this guy right down the middle or this guy right down the middle and looked at the surface that you just cut um, you can see you have uh, this interfacing surface right here is spherical in nature so this ball that's within the rod end um, it can twist, uh, it can rotate in this direction, it can rotate in that direction, it can essentially rotate in any direction. So this is, uh, you know, a three degree of freedom connection. Uh, it, it constrains translation, obviously, when you put a bolt through this, um, you know, the part that it's constraining can't, um, can't move, but it can rotate around the, the center of this. So when we have a strut, we have two of these joints, right? So essentially, um, if we attach our cube to this strut, um, what, what's happening is down here, we can rotate in any direction and up here, we can rotate in any direction. So for example, if I were to make like a, another version of this, um, and then so like the strut is rotated and let's also make the cube rotated. Um, so now it's in a new position. Obviously we haven't constrained all five or all six degrees of freedom because it can move, but um, we have constrained one degree of freedom, right? If we 
let me grab another pen color. If we take uh, a force and apply it straight up like this, um, this is fixed um, in translation. This is fixed in translation. If we try to pull on this, then uh, you, you essentially get tension here, tension through the cube, and then it's not going to go anywhere. So we know we have constraint one degree of freedom. Um, any force in any other direction, like this direction, obviously this whole thing is just going to spin. Um, so that tells us one strut contain, constrains one degree of freedom. So how many struts do you need to constrain an object um, in space? Six struts, which you can see I have right here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, what the, the benefit of this is, um, is that, like I said, the geometry of the object can, can change, which is very, very important for fuel tanks, right? Because fuel tanks expand um, as, you know, it, think of it literally like a balloon. It's, it's like a very stiff balloon. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you blow up a party balloon, you, um, you're, you know, adding pressure to the inside of the balloon and the balloon expands. Um, a fuel tank is the exact same deal, um, except, you know, it's the, the expansion is much smaller, right? You, you can't really see the expansion because it's happening, um, you know, far less than like, you know, a quarter inch or something or half an inch, uh, for like a 40 inch tank, right? You're not really going to notice, but it is expanding. Um, and if you're rigidly mounting it between two points, um, let's draw down here. If you have your, your sphere here and let's say you're mounting it like this and you're mounting it like this, um, then, uh, once you pressurize it, it'll start to expand, right? And suddenly this is the shape it wants to be which is past your support. So it's essentially going to be like pushing against your support and like trying to essentially break your structure, right? That, that pressure um, is being held. Uh, so like, you know, think of like you're blowing up a balloon, but you're, you're holding your hand around it as you blow it up. You're, you're not letting the balloon expand and you're, you're kind of pushing against your hand. Um, so that can be quite bad for a structure. Um, you know, a structure stiff enough to mount this 3,000 pound fuel tank, but also, um, you know, it's going to be taking an extra pressure load on top of it. It's going to be not ideal. So essentially what we want is a structure that can fully support the fuel tank, but not be, um, not take load from the pressurization of the fuel tank. And of course that is where, uh, minimally constrained assemblies come into play. So, like I said before, um, six struts exactly constrains the six degrees of freedom, and if the object change shape, um, the the struts will uh, you know change position to adapt to that. So, um, one last kind of demonstration before we um, move into the CAD here, um, and you know if you're seeing this. Uh, I, I do back up my analysis with hand calculations of the uh, pressure within the spherical tank. Um, so we'll get to this later on in the video. Um, so lastly, I want to introduce the idea of three to one constraints. Um, so obviously, if you add up three plus two plus one, you have six. <laughs> Um, you know, we can, we can do first grade math. So, so uh, essentially this is, um, the way that we're going to constrain our fuel tank. So of course this is degrees of freedom. Um, so at one point in the tank, we're going to constrain three degrees of freedom. At another point in the tank, we're going to constrain two degrees of freedom. And at another point, we're going to constrain one. Um, and, and this can help a lot for, uh, you know, reducing the amount of interface points um, and, and making a structure that, that makes sense. But you can also totally do 
tons of different constraint schemes that don't follow this. This is just the most convenient one, and, and I think is the, the easiest one to understand. Um, so what we do is start with a tripod. This is going to be the three degrees of freedom. So essentially, um, to constrain three degrees of freedom of our, um, our, our whatever we're trying to con constrain in this tank, in this case, a sphere, um, we want to essentially have a point that is fully fixed in space, right? So at this point, um, the sphere will be mounted um, such that at that point, the sphere cannot translate, but it can rotate around that point, right? So if we do have like green, yeah. So if we draw in our sphere here, and again, I apologize for the possibly lackluster drawing, um, but at this point, um, the sphere cannot move. It is fixed in space around this point. But of course, our sphere can still rotate around this point. Right, so imagine uh, you're just putting like one of these balls, ball joints um, at that point, and you're allowing it to twist around it, you're allowing it to rotate up and down, uh, left and right, whatever. Um, and we achieve this through um, something called a tripod. So it is exactly like a tripod that you would um, use on a camera. Um, and let me jump into CAD here because it might be a little bit easier to see. Um, so you can see we have, um, you know, our fully fixed point right here. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is our fully fixed point. This is where you would put a ball joint in. We'll talk about this um, in just a moment. But um, essentially, uh, you know, with this point, this point, and this point down here fixed, we then get a fully fixed point right here. So that point can't move. The The easiest way to make a tripod is actually to take a bipod and attach another strut to it. So if you imagine you have a pair of um, scissors, basically, um, so you have a strut. This is like your ball joint. You have one strut that is rigidly attached to the ball joint. So like the ball joint is part of this strut. Um, and then you have uh, another strut that has uh, a connection point here. And, and this is a, like a, think of like a pair of scissors. Um, you can't like, twist the joint. Um, it only opens and closes. So this is like a, a pin joint. And the only thing the other strut can do is uh, rotate around this point. So essentially you have a mounting point on the structure here and the mounting point on the structure here. Um, and then you want to, it's like, um, this has, like this point has one unconstrained degree of freedom. Um, and if you then take a strut and just add some lugs onto it and then attach another strut, you can constrain that last degree of freedom. Um, so essentially that's what I have here. Uh, so this whole end cap, like the tripod end is rigidly attached to this tube. Um, and then there is uh, basically a swing arm that comes off of here. This creates a bipod. Um, and then I have, this would be a, a strut with a rod end um, that constrains that last degree of freedom. So um, the, let me just grab a picture. Just going to grab a snip of this um, and then bring it over here. So um, essentially, we have a rotation point here and here, um, and we have this line. So um, this bipod assembly can rotate about this line. So what constrains that rotation is this strut um, to essentially prevent it from like, you know, if it tries to rotate, this strut is going to not allow that. Um, okay, so then on the other side, um, so, so that's three degrees of freedom, right? We know at this point, the sphere can rotate in any direction. Um, 
about about this point. So we want to constrain the others. So um, we're going to do the so we, we've done the three. Now we want to do the two. Um, and for the two, we're going to use a bipod, right? So you can kind of see three, two, one is also the number of struts, three struts, tripod, two struts, bipod, and then a singular strut. Um, so for that, on the opposite side, um, doesn't necessarily have to be the opposite side, but you know, we want to support the the fuel tank as best as possible. So putting it on the opposite side, um, you know, just happens to, to give you that. So if we add two struts, we're going to do dotted lines for it's behind it. Um, so we have our point here on the opposite side um, and the uh, two struts, right? So essentially a bipod, like I said, um, it, it is just the tripod without the extra strut here. So pretend this is gone. So the bipod can rotate about this axis, right? The axis between the two. So if I, I pop over here, I have our bipod. Um, so um, essentially, let me actually, let me do this in a point where I can see all, all three of these struts over here. Um, there we go. Uh, so paste this in. So um, we have the line that connects these two endpoints. So essentially, our bipod can rotate around this point. Um, so we know. We're fixed on the other side. The sphere can rotate in any direction. So essentially, the, the bipod can rotate in and out. Um, so as long as the sphere can rotate and the bipod can rotate, there will always be a solution. Um, not always. There are, uh, let me caveat that, there, there are some instances where like, if the bipod is too far away and it's simply too short to even reach the, the sphere, then obviously it's not going to work. But within reason, there's always going to be a solution in which the, the sphere point here can find the bipod. You just have to rotate them and then connect them up. Um, so, uh, and, and then this final strut here, um, this creates, uh, so if we have our tripod point back here, this creates an axis. So now the sphere is fixed um, along this axis and then it can still rotate around this axis. So essentially we just add a, uh, a sixth and final strut right here. So now it can no longer spin around the axis between these two points. Um, okay, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense, but now let me just make my final point and then we'll move into CAD. Um, this sphere gets pressurized and it, and it grows, right? Um, so, Essentially, right now, it's, I think I made it 40 inches. Uh, it might grow to 40 and a half inches. Um, and like I said, there's always, within reason, there's always going to be a solution with like the, the sphere is rotated in such a way and the bipod is rotated in such a way that, um, you know, you, you can find or you can still have a minimally constrained assembly and the struts will essentially move to adapt to the new shape of the sphere. So if we do a top-down view, um, let's actually use CAD so we don't have to draw it. Um, top-down view is like this. Um, okay, so we have, we have our fixed point right here. This cannot move. However, the bipod can rotate around, um, you know, obviously the struts are on top of each other, but essentially the bipod can rotate. So the sphere will get bigger like this. Obviously I'm greatly exaggerating the view here. Um, and I was hitting my mug and my keyboard while drawing the sphere. So it came out especially bad. Um, but essentially our new fixation point comes right here. And then because this bipod can rotate the shape of the struts will adapt and, and this one too it'll swing out like this um, so essentially you have a object that is fully constrained in space but if the shape of the object changes um, then 
the, the struts will move and adapt to that shape within reason of like the kinematics. Um, you know, obviously the, the struts have to be long enough. Um, and then also the joints can't bottom out. So there are two caveats. Um, it has to be a, like a, a realistic solution, like the struts um, need to be long enough. Obviously, there's a point where if this kept growing like massively, um, the strut simply wouldn't be long enough to reach it. So that is one pitfall. Um, Google activated at something I said and started talking to me. Um, <laughs> the So the strut obviously has to be possible. Um, you, you very rarely encounter that issue uh, with, you know, space structures. Um, but the other thing is you, you can't bottom out the joints at, at some point, the rotation in the joint, um, comes to a point where like, uh, hardware starts hitting each other and essentially, um, you know, things will bottom out and then not work as a minimum constraint assembly. So, um, I know that was a long winded explanation, but I, I think it's important. Um, and like I said, um, you, you can see this phenomenon in the finite element model, and I will certainly point it out to you. Um, you know, you'll see the struts adjust to the shape of the, the pressurized sphere, which I think is pretty cool seeing uh, in our finite element model. Um, okay, like I said, we're going to jump into CAD. Um, so I don't want to linger on CAD for too long. Um, you know, my, my, my purpose isn't to uh, be a CAD teacher, I guess. Um, it's, you know, the, the CAD is a, our, our tool to get to the analysis. Uh, so if you're an engineering student, um, you know, within your first year or so, your, your school will probably teach you some CAD program, whether it's NX or SOLIDWORKS or, um, you know, whatever, even Fusion maybe. Uh, um, you know, if not, everything here is fairly simple and, and there's a host of tutorials on the internet on, on how to do whatever CAD program. So, um, you know, if, if you want to get up to date on CAD, you can watch some of those tutorials. Okay. So basically I'm starting with a sphere right on the origin. Fusion has a command where you can just literally make a sphere of a certain diameter. So I started with that. Uh, and then I used a sketch to basically cut out myself, um, some, some flat, pads on the sphere. Um, so I have like an area to mount my struts. Um, and then I added in some, some radii, uh, just to, to smooth out that transition. So essentially what I've created is let me go back to my pictures here. Um, I've created, uh, like these kind of end caps here that you can see. Um, I think the other one was a better image. Oops. Uh, yeah, so I created these, these end caps here. Um, next up, um, I started with the design of the tripod end. Um, so pretty much everything I'm going to do here is just very basic shapes, like extrudes, fillets, chamfers. Um, so essentially just kind of blocking out the design in very simple elementary shapes. So like this is just a square and a half half circle. Um, the next shape is just a square attached to that going off diagonally. Um, here are the lugs for the third strut. Um, chamfered that. Uh, then I added the, the tube body for, um, you know, the main strut. Then I uh, cut away some of the material here to do, this is the, the swivel point, like the, the kind of scissor joint, basically. Um, added a chamfer. Uh, this is the hole. Uh, so this is where you would press in a ball joint. Um, so this is where you would insert one of these guys to give us a um, three degree of freedom point here. So the sphere can rotate around this point. Um, added a hole for the swivel joint, um, a hole for the uh, lug joint. Um, here I added uh, just a shape of like the for the bottom of the lugs just to give them more support. A um, bunch of fillets here. 
basically just added uh, radi radii to everything. So all around this, the strut body, I have a radius. Um, more radii, just kind of smoothing everything out. You, you want to prevent sharp radii at um, roots, so like an internal radius, but sharp radii um, on external surfaces are generally okay. Um, again, more filleting here. Um, added some radii like here. Uh, added some chambers. Oh, I think I might have missed it. Uh, here, I, I extruded inward um, to create like a, a hollow tube basically here. Um, so this is going to be one big machine part. Um, so I, I have, I, you know, created some parts uh, and analyzed some parts similar to this in industry. Um, okay, so now we're going to, this is like essentially the elementary shape blocked out, right? We have, um, this is where our tube would be attached. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways that you can attach two tubes together. Um, one of them is welding. You know, you can just uh, put these two tubes next to each other and weld. The other one is you could drill a bunch of holes and rivet through it. Um, so um, in, in this exercise, I'm essentially assuming that they're just attached. And I'll show that in the analysis. Um, you know, like I said, in the future, we can we can do more uh, in-depth analysis. But, but for now, I'm just going to abstract this connection away since it's not really the purpose of the video. Um, so, so this is our shape blocked out. Right, we have our central point where the sphere mounts and a bolt goes through this. We have our our two lugs for uh, our, just like our single one degree of freedom strut. And then we have our scissor joint over here. Um, so now if I go ahead and hide the sphere, um, obviously this is a big hunk of metal. Um, and a lot of times with the space industry, um, you want things to be light. So I started uh, cutting things out. So I just went with uh like an offset curve and just extruded all the material out of here um and i think i did the same thing yep on the other side here um and then added in so like this is a a rib on both sides just to keep some some stiffness uh, another rib here so it goes from the tube straight through um um straight through the center point to keep stiffness high there. And then uh, another rib um, kind of where on the opposite side of this lug. Um, and then these are a bunch of radii. Uh, again, in internal corners, you want to make sure you have radii everywhere. So this just uh, gives us a nice smooth radius. So uh, I think these are all, yeah. So um, I talked about this last time. Um, at least in the free version, you cannot export parasolids. Um, you can only export steps and I step files. It's like a 3D a neutral 3D CAD file. Um, and I couldn't figure out uh, how to export curves and step. It might just be a limitation. Parasolid, you can. Um, so essentially what I'm doing is in FEMAP, you only need a, a single line, like a curve to make uh, beam elements. So essentially, I just create surfaces, which step can export. Um, and then I'm just going to use this line uh, along the center as the strut. So that, that's what these three surfaces are. They're just to get me my my lines. And then just for representational purposes, I did throw some tubes in here. So obviously, this is what you know this would approximately look like. Um, but of course, these are just very rough. Um, you know what what they what it would look like of course this is not what the joint would look like it's gonna be like a you know you're gonna have lugs here that connects with a pin through this um, and like i said this will be this will terminate back here and be a a rod end that is screwed into the tube um but you know for for visualization um, i think it's still good so essentially um when when this strut comes to uh integration like to be added to the spacecraft um if i hide this guy and this guy this is what it will come as um and then you you bolt this up 
and then add like the swivel, bolt that in, and then add this guy. So like this is one assembly. Um, oops, this is another assembly, and this is a third assembly. Um, and then let me show the sphere again. Um, so I, I think these are just the other struts. So yeah, here's the bipod. Um, I, of course, you would have another machined piece somewhat similar to this. Um, I decided, uh, you know, for this exercise, if you can make a tripod joint, then you can make a bipod joint. Um, and it would just add some time to the video that wouldn't really um, give you a lot of extra extra knowledge or insight. So I decided to just do uh, represent these as as beams and abstract away the, the tripod end here. Um, and if I keep stepping through this, um, oh, actually, I did decide to remove um, that uh, pad there um, because it, it, you'll see it's it's much easier to mesh the sphere if you don't have that. Um, and then I added this final strut right here. So that's how the CAD's made. Um, as you can see, it's it's really nothing complicated or, or crazy. Um, I pretty much only use like extrude. Like I use the sphere tool, extrude, chamfer, fill it, um, and like the tube tool. And that's like just about it. Um, so, you know, nothing too complex. Um, now I will say, if I was doing this in industry, um, I would probably do a technique called mid-surfacing for analysis. Um, so, so basically, we'll, we'll talk about plate elements in a little while, but plate elements essentially are just two-dimensional, like a sheet of paper, um, and they allow you to input the thickness in the model. So like if you analyze, let's say, like uh, a plate, uh, like a, a piece of sheet metal, and you're like, oh, hang on, my analysis is showing that I'm way overstressing this piece. Um, you, you don't have to redesign it in CAD and then export it and redo the analysis. You just go into the analysis properties and change the thickness of that sheet. Um, and then your, your analysis can be rerun in you know a matter of seconds. So when you're just starting out to design a part, um, a lot of times you, you want to do that same thing and essentially create... Uh, surfaces that represent this whole shape. So then in the CAD model, or sorry, in the analysis program, you can change the thickness as you're analyzing. Because, um, you know, starting out, you, you don't know how thick the wall should be. Um, you can do hand calcs to help, um, which will help for sure. But, um, you know, a lot of times you just, you don't know how thick you want it to be. So I, I think this could be mid-surfaced. Um, it, it might be some tricky in some areas uh, to get surfaces to represent all of these. Um, but for the purpose of this exercise, like I said, I want to do a model that has beams, plates, plate elements, and solid elements. Um, so, like, you know, I, I decided just to leave it as a solid so we could have all three of those. But um, in industry, I might make this um, a plate model. It's kind of a toss up. I would probably see how feasible it is. Okay, that being said, um, we can go ahead and hop into our analysis program, um, which is VMAP. So uh, just FYI, um, if uh, you know, you're know you gonna export this, you would change it to, um, where is it, step? Of course, Parasolid, which is generally my preferred for analysis uh, is not available. Actually, I think at all in Fusion. Um, I think I guess also works, but I guess is grayed out. Uh, so step, um, it does do the job not quite as well, but you know, we can get around it. Um, so you know, of course, you can export. Um, but I've already done that. So let me hop over to Fusion. And like I said, we're going to start from scratch Do file new. First thing I like to do when I open up as an, a new fusion is to change the background to um, white because it's more professional for you know reports and whatnot uh, and screenshots so you have like a white background on like your white reporter or, or slide deck um, so you 
you don't have like a weird gradient pasted on top. Um, and there's a few other settings I like to change, but I went to view background to get that. Um, so uh, we have our layers here. Layers are essentially, I, I explained a little bit of this in the last video. Um, you know, I'll probably do like a brief overview every time, but I, I won't go super, super um, in depth. Uh, so layers are essentially groupings for for elements and essentially your anything in your model. Um, so I'm going to call this uh, layer two is tank. So this is where we're going to put our elements for our tank. Layer three will be our tripod end. Um, layer four will be our struts. And layer five will be our connectors. So now we have five layers. So we're going to go to our geometry layer. Um, sometimes I do partition out the geometry into its uh, different layers to be with the actual elements. But um, if you have a really big model, that's advised. But I think for now, maybe we'll, we'll move some stuff later. But um, OK, so you can see I have two files here because I uh, did, I was doing the mesh and decided to redo the mesh. So I um, exported the file. Let me grab this guy. Um, and then this is step rate options. Uh, you don't need to change a ton of this. Um, and hit OK. And you should see, here we go. Um, our CAD model is now in Femap. Um, so delete, uh, we, we, like I said, we don't actually need these, um, solids and I forgot to, uh, remove them before I exported. So it's not a problem. Let's just go delete geometry solid and we'll select, um, if you right click and do pick front for some reason, it defaults to pick normal, which means that you're selecting the center of gravity of the object and not just like what your cursor's on. So pick front helps a lot. Um, so we want to select all of the solid tubes here. Um, this show selected button, make sure you have the right thing. Uh, and then hit OK. Delete six solids, yes. So now those are gone. We don't have to worry about those. Um, turn off points because it can be confusing and we don't need them. Um, so. Um, I think we'll just jump in. Actually, uh, before we do that, we need to make um, our materials. So we're going to make the fuel tank out of titanium. Um, and then we'll make it titanium 6.4, which is 6AL4V, um, which is a, a very common type of titanium. Um, oh, I should have looked this up before. I, I want to say it's 14,000. Um, um, modulus of elasticity, oh, it's 16,500. Um, okay, so let's do 16,500, and that's KSI, so one, two, three. That gives us PSI. Um, and then Poisson's ratio is 0 0.33. Okay, um, so this is our material for the shell, and then we also want aluminum. Um, What type of aluminum? Uh, let's just do 2024. I, I don't know exactly what they used. Uh, generally, the the alloy um, isn't going to change our Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio too much. Um, so 10,000 KSI and again 0 0.33. That one I do know. Um, so alloy will change the uh, elastic modulus and Poisson's ratio a few percent. Uh, Poisson's ratio probably not much at all, um, but still a few percent. So generally, um, the, the alloy is very, very important for the strength of material, but for the elastic modulus, not so much. Um, there's a crow outside that keeps interrupting me. I guess it has something to say. Um, but when you're in industry, you want to be you know, accurate with those values. Um, so there is a, a database that has like pretty much every aerospace material and 
all the properties. Um, so, you know, you'll have that at your fingertips. Um, but even then, you know, like I said, the elastic modulus and the Poisson's ratio aren't going to change much. Um, okay, now we want to make our properties. So um, we're going to go with titanium, 6, 4, um, and then we'll say 0 0.08 thick. So that this is the thickness. Like I said, we're doing a plate element. Um, so, so essentially before we were making material, which is just like the material properties, and now we're creating a element property, which we tell the the software like, okay, this is now the shape of the element that I want with that material. So we're going to make this 0 0.08 um, thick. And then material, we have to select titanium 6.4. And the rest of the stuff we don't need to worry about. Um, we don't need another plate element. Um, so now you can see we have our titanium 6.4 material and our titanium 0 0.08 thick plate. Um, now, uh, let's create another one. Um, we're going to set it to aluminum and we're going to set element property type to, um, where is it? Solid. Uh, so this, we really don't need to select anything at all because it's just a solid. There's no geometry, um, inherent to the element. The geometry is inherent to the, uh, the solid model that you select that we've imported. So we're going to call this aluminum 2024 solid. Okay. So there's our property there. Um, and then let's also, we're going to make a few different, um, beam elements, uh, for like tapers and whatnot, but, um, let's just do, um, I think I might have to reference my model. So I remember what, what shape I did. Um, where is it here? Uh, beam tube. Okay, 2.1 by 0.05. Okay, so we're going to do new uh, beam element. So AL beam tube, and then we'll do 2.1 by 0.05. Um, and then where it says shape, uh, we can define shape as a circular tube radius is 1.05 and thickness is 0.05 so essentially our inner diameter is going to be um, uh, two inches okay and then it auto fills all of our um, beam sectional properties and hit okay so now we have our three um, types of materials we have plate solid beam um, so let's go ahead and start meshing. Um, we're going to jump into the meshing toolbox. Um, so there's a lot of tools here. I'll, I'll probably use them more in depth in a future video. I'm going to go fairly surface um, level for this guy. So if we go where it says mesh surface right here, um, under property, we want to make sure we change this to titanium 6.4, 0 0.08 thick. Um, and then, uh, so there's some settings here we want to look at, um, size all connect is what we want for now. Um, in the future, uh, this mesh size. So I don't remember exactly what I set it to for the other one, but I'll, I, I'm going to tinker with it anyways. Um, this mesh size essentially just like remeshes the whole thing at that size. Um, and if you leave on size all connect and have two different uh, mesh sizes, it'll essentially remesh a surface next to it. Um, so if you put like internal free edges, then it will only size um, like stuff that already doesn't have a size on it. So, um, but this is our first kind of click. So we just can do size all connect. Um, this button up here lets you select. And then um, this should work reasonably well. Actually, oh, I forgot. Um, two more things. You want quad four. Uh, so this will create square elements with a node on each edge. Um, you don't need eight quads. Or sorry, you don't need eight nodes. Um, you can you know, just leave it on quad four. And then mapped mesh. 
this essentially tries to make a like a like a perfect grid of elements um so map mesh is definitely preferred if you can do it but not all geometry can be made from a map mesh um this can't though um so you can see essentially we have just like grids like uv grids of elements going in both directions if i turn off uh, let me make sure oh see i'll do this I, I do this regularly i forget so whatever layer you have activated is the layer that the elements will get put in so i just put all the tank elements into the geometry layer and i also put all of our materials and properties but that's not as important so we're going to go to modify layer um mesh we can just do select all and you can see everything selected Hit okay and then we'll move that to tank um so now if i unselect geometry you can see the geometry gets hidden but the the tank is still there and then we're going to go with uh color width i like to do this uh property colors and then if we hit f6 key um we're going to go to labels um, and then elements uh, i think it's actually yeah filled edges and then it starts out with this lime green which i don't like so i always do use view color and then the view color is just set to black um, which now looks much better uh, okay so as you can see it's done a pretty good job um, at meshing uh, the big thing is though elements are quite long um, we, we want to have you know elements that are a bit more square uh, and the other thing is um, we want to have an odd number of elements along the bottom here because we want essentially uh, an element to connect this guy up to uh, so that's quite easy to do um, so we're going to go to our meshing toolbox down here again and uh where it says mesh sizing now we can essentially uh again with our select tool we can say i want to increase or decrease operation increase decrease set to um the the number of uh nodes along the edge so the nodes are all these green dots so if we hit this decrease now we've decreased it by one um it's an odd number now and we have a um a node right at the center which is good so that's now set how we want it um although maybe that's a bit too dense let's see what do we have here let's turn on our filled edges um i think that's okay uh just kind of referencing my other work um i, I did do that uh, a little over a week ago now so it's it's not super super fresh in my mind so um maybe almost a good thing so you, you can kind of see my thought process live um, okay, so we want to increase the density along this direction on the sphere. So we're going to come over here um, and let's turn off all those lines. Uh, so you can see we want to set this to increase um, and we can do it one at a time and we should do it back and forth. Now, because this is a mapped mesh, um, when I increase this the the number of nodes on this guy it automatically increases the the corresponding side if this was a free mesh it wouldn't um, and it would essentially create a jumbled mess um, of the 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 mesh here um, because there's like different elements different numbers of elements on different sides and it would have to adapt from one side to the other so um, let's just add in uh, I think we'll do increase by four. How about, um, and then we'll, how does that look? I think a little bit more maybe. Um, I'm just looking at the height of this element. Um, let's see, I think maybe once more and then we'll be good um okay i think that looks pretty good um so you can see we ended up with six thousand elements um and we have a pretty reasonable mesh density for like this half sphere 
um, if we were to do this with solid elements, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment, um, we would probably have many, many thousands of more elements. Um, so uh, basically, a little bit of theory here. Um, as you can see, this is a plate element. Like I said, it's like a sheet of paper. Um, each element has four nodes, and it just connects to the next one. Um, and like I said, the thickness is controlled within the software, not by any sort of geometry. So if I turn on visualization of thickness, you can see now I can see how thick this is. Um, but, you know, this is just for our purpose um, to visualize it. Uh, the, the software doesn't obviously see this thickness. It just sees like the, the property card. Um, and again, like if I'm like, oh, wow, this tank is like definitely not thick enough. Um, then I don't have to re-export geometry. I can just go to edit and make this like to really exaggerate it here. I'll do one inch um, and then control G to regenerate. And now you can see we have this crazy, crazy thick tank here. Um, so that's the main um, kind of uh, benefit of doing 2D elements. They're called 2D, obviously, because they uh, don't have any thickness except for based on the property card. Um, that's the main benefit. Um, well, two main benefits, actually. One of them is that you can express the same geometry for m much less elements, so it's the, the model will be faster to run. And then also you can um, very easily change the uh, thickness without needing to change the geometry of your part. Um, let's see. Okay, so now we want to... Um, we want to turn back on our geometry, um, and, uh, so let's do these guys. So this is actually what I was talking about before. Um, I'll just show you. So if we go to mesh surface and leave size all connect on, um, if I hit this, it has resized my, my other mesh that I, that I tampered with or I tweaked. <laughs> Um, and you can see it's kind of made a mess here. There's some triangles in here. Triangles you want to avoid uh, as much as possible because they're not as accurate as the quad elements. Um, but you can see it's 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 resized my mesh, so I don't want that. I want to change it to size all internal slash free edges. Um, and now I can do this, um, and you can see it has uh, created our... Um, our mesh here and it is still mapped uh, and the reason why it looks like this is because we haven't gone in and updated the um, mesh density along here so um, let me go to uh, set to uh, how many nodes are along this edge okay so there's 27 nodes along this edge um, or sorry 27 elements so if we set this to 27, um, and you can see uh, when I click this, nothing happens. Um, so that means I have it right. So then if I select this to 27 too, um, now we're matching all along the outside. And, uh, you know, we have a nice, once again, a nice uniform mesh. Um, so let's do that over here. Make sure we have size internal free edges only. Click on this guy. Um, oops. Uh, I want to do set to. There we go. Um, so now we have again a nice uniform mesh converging in towards the center here. And so now this last guy, we're just going to go ahead and mesh here. Unfortunately, um, there isn't a ton that we can do to tweak this, um, at least with the geometry that I have. Uh, so you can see it's done an okay job. It, it's very, very fine, um, which I don't prefer. Uh, but, you know, I, I would probably try to go in and add some, some extra geometry here. Or um, you can also, like, remove elements in the center. So then you get this nice mesh all the way down. Um, for now, though, I'm just going to leave it, uh, you know, in industry, you might want to tweak this surface 
because um, you can see we got some triangles here. We got some elements that are a bit weird shaped. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it might be okay generally if you have a mesh that looks like this and your stress is extremely low. Um, it's fine. Uh, you know, you don't generally have to worry about it. But if you have like very high stress in areas like this, then you look, you look into it more. So there are ways to mitigate this. Um, but you know, for now, uh, we would have to tweak the geometry and add guiding lines and all that. And I'll just leave it as is for now because it's, it's, it's okay. Um, but again, this is very, very dense. Um, you know, it added like a thousand elements, uh, and some of the elements are not great quality. Um, okay. So now we've meshed half of the, the sphere here. Um, and you know what I just realized after all that of how I always mess this up, I didn't actually change our layer. So we've once again added, um, all of these elements to the wrong layer. So, um, do select all. Okay. And then we'll move it to tank. Okay. Let's go ahead and save. Um, let's go ahead and save this for now. So we'll do video to live. Um, and for today, I'm going to take a break and continue tomorrow, but obviously for you guys, I'll be back in just one second. Okay. So let's continue on. The next order of business is to go ahead and mirror this mesh that we've created so far. So we want to mirror this guy top to bottom so we don't have to remesh. And then we also want to mirror our end cap here um, across the Z Y or the Y Z plane, which you can see right here, Y Z. So let's start with mesh reflect element. And then we're going to go to method on surface, select our surface, hit the little show selected button to make sure we have it selected correctly. Hit okay. Um, and so there's two ways you can do this. You can either leave other entities to include geometry on, and it will make a copy of our surface here, or we could leave it off and reassociate the geometry. Generally, I find it easiest to leave this on and then just delete the old geometry. So you don't have to worry about reassociating geometry. And in some cases you never have to care about geometry at all when you reflect a mesh. But in this case, we are going to be applying a pressure load to the surface for this, the fuel tank. So we do care about geometry. Um, so we're going to leave that on and hit okay. Now we do our plane. Um, so we want to reflect across the X, Y plane, right? If I, so we, we know our origin is at the center of the sphere. That's how I made it in fusion X, Y plane. You can see is right here. So essentially we just establish a plane. So base is at zero, zero, zero. That's correct. Then let's do one, zero, zero. Oops. And then we'll do zero, one, zero to get our plane. And then if we hit okay, you can see we've reflected the mesh across the, the X, Y plane. And it looks good. Um, we're not done yet. We need to do the reflection across the Y, Z plane now. So we're going to do the same thing. Mesh reflect element method on surface. Select the three surfaces we have. Looks correct. Hit OK. And again, we're going to leave geometry on. And now we want to reflect, reflect across the Y, Z plane, which is actually what it defaults to the Y, Z plane. So we're already good on that. Hit OK. And now you can see same mesh over here. So when you reflect a mesh, the elements aren't automatically 
connected to one another for an element to be connected in a finite element model. They essentially need to share nodes, right? So if I zoom in here, this is along the border where we reflected. Um, we have this element and this element, right? And for these two to be connected, you would have to share this node right here, this green dot, and this node right here, that green dot. And if we click on the element here, we can see our nodes are 6280, 6281, 377, and 378. And on the other side, we have 13, 780, 780, 818, 13722. You can see we, of course, do not share any nodes. So this, we haven't created a, a connected sphere. We have created half of a sphere with another half that's next to it, coincident with some of the elements or nodes, um, but none of it's actually connected together. So if we tried to ran this model right now, essentially the halves would fly off, uh, this top piece would fly off. Nothing would be constrained and the whole model would just error out. So all we have to do is tools, check, coincident nodes. Um, now you can select a small piece of the model, with shift click and like only check that area. Um, you can also, you know, just select the whole model. If I do uh, reset and then do select all, we can do that for now because these are the only elements. Sometimes you want to do, you know, just the local area. There are some instances where you, you might want to have coincident nodes and not to remove them. So if we hit OK, and now this tells you how far it's going to check. They should all be perfectly coincident, so I shouldn't need to check, um, you know, super far away. 0.01 should be totally fine. Hit OK here, and we'll see 387 nodes merged. Uh, so, just want to make sure everything looks all merged up. I don't have any issues. Everything seems to be good. Okay, well, if we do have any issues, we will certainly see it um, when we start running the analysis and we can go ahead and fix it then. So let's continue on here. I think we'll go ahead and mesh the tripod end now. So we're going to, uh, I'll, I'll show a few different mesh sizes and I think the one I settled on was 0 0.2 mesh size. But um, let's hide our tank for now and let's also turn off the surfaces. Actually, not yet. let's leave those on. And we'll go to mesh geometry or mesh control sorry size on solid select our solid here and hit ok uh, so the default is 0 0.1 so let's start with something huge like like 0 0.8 or something and then we'll go to mesh geometry solids hit ok um, and then so uh, you can change this to tet mesh only. Tet slash pyramids will create elements. If you want to transition from like a brick uh, hex mesh to a tetrahedral mesh, uh, a tetrahedral is a four sided solid element. Um, you'll see in a second, but it's essentially a, a triangular pyramid with 10 nodes. It's very important that you leave mid side nodes checked. So, uh, triangular pyramid has four vertices and six edges and mid side nodes puts a node in the middle of each edge so you have 10 total nodes and make sure you have this checked because if not your your element and your data won't be as accurate so this is an absolute disaster right this looks terrible and it's not going to produce accurate results because we simply have not enough elements um, and you can see even 
you know, even though this looks awful, there's still 3,870 elements. And uh, so if I select one of these, you can see it is a tetrahedral, um, right? It's four triangles connected together. Here's a better one that you can see. Uh, but this element quality is absolute trash. Um, so it is possible to also go the other way, right? If I go mesh, um, mesh control size on solid, and let's do like 0.05. Um, now if we go to geometry solids, click on this guy, um, tet mesh. Okay. Now it is going to make a ridiculously fine mesh. And it's taking a while to load because the mesh is so fine. Okay, so you can see it has made 71,000 elements. Uh, and if I turn off nodes here, it's so fine that you can't even see. You can see this is just like, this is just way finer than you would ever need to do. Um, like there's no reason to have this many elements and this will drastically increase your solve time uh, for for no real reason. So, you know, you want to find the middle ground, which your element quality is good, but um, you still have, you know, a, a reasonably low amount of elements. And that's why a lot of times plate elements, like 2D elements are so attractive because your, your results, um, as long as you're using them correctly, your results are still going to be pretty accurate. But your... Um, element numbers are going to be, you know, much more reasonable. We mesh this entire sphere with, um, you know, what was it? 6,000 elements for the half. And even that might have been a little bit too dense. I might have gone, gotten a little bit carried away. So let's do a middle ground size on solid. Let's go, let's go 0.15. And we'll do mesh, geometry, solids, hit this guy, and tap mesh only. Make sure mid side nodes, nodes is checked. And this is a reasonable middle ground. It's, it's fairly fine, um, but it's not ridiculous. And you can see you, you want your tetrahedrals to be as um, you know uniform as possible you want your your side lengths to be like as equilateral as you can possibly get them so you don't want any like really thin sliver elements like this isn't great right here um, this one or this one and it's not you know, you have to kind of use your judgment um, if, and like this area is also pretty poor mesh quality. Um, and you can locally increase, like, um, I might as well do it right now. If we go to mesh control, size on surface, um, oh, where am I? Oh, I'm on like the back side. There it is. So if we want to increase like locally, 0.08. And then we'll do mesh geometry solids, delete existing mesh and remesh. And now you see it's, it's done this area in a much finer mesh, um, so it's a little bit better. So you can see you, you want to, you know, have as good mesh quality as you can get it with a reasonable amount of elements. Um, just for the purposes of the video, though, I'm going to just put this at 0 0.2 um, just so it, it runs reasonably fast. And we'll do mesh. Uh, solids, this guy, delete existing mesh, and tet mesh, just so, you know, we can, 
reduce our element count here. So now we have 35,000 elements and, and the quality is not great through here, but, uh, you know, for the purposes of the video, it'll be fine. And, you know, I, I showed when you want to have more accurate results, you can do individual surfaces and increase the density there as needed. But by and large, for like the rest of this part, the, the density seems okay. So, um, and again, in, in industry, you're going to do a lot of tinkering and, and playing with things. And I'll, I'll just show one more thing. Uh, there's also element quality checks. So if we wanted to select all these elements, sure. Um, VMAP has quality checks. Nastran also has quality checks. Uh, so we can check some Tetra properties. Um, and you can see it checks and tells you if any elements fail. Um, th there is some literature that you can look up on like Nastran and FEMAP um, data books that you can see what to set those thresholds at to, to check your element quality, your, your element skews, your Jacobians and whatnot. But maybe I'll do a video on that in the future. But for now, I think that's out of scope. I don't want this video to get too long. So let's keep moving forward. So we have our plate mesh 2D. Now we have our uh, solid mesh, the 3D with the tetrahedrals. So you can kind of see the difference. This one inherits a, a surface and uses a property card to say how thick that surface is. Whereas this one, we didn't input anything as far as geometry. It essentially just created these 3D elements on the geometry that we already had. And finally, we're going to make beam elements for our struts. So this only inherits one dimension from geometry and the cross section of the strut is input. So we have our surfaces here that we're going to use for curves and we'll activate our struts layer. And let's go ahead and do meshing. Mesh sizing increase to increase by two. So the thing about beam elements is they are exact solutions. It uses like the theoretical equations, you know, like the moment times the distance from the neutral axis divided by the second moment of inertia. So to get an accurate result for a beam element, you only need one element because it's it's exact. If you want accurate deflection data, so you want to see how the beam bends, or if you want accurate buckling data, essentially every extra element you add is another buckling mode that you can see, or, you know, same idea if you want accurate um, natural frequency, you know, frequency response shapes, then you, you need more elements to model like the, the bent shape of the beam. So just looking for stress, one element's enough, but if you want deflected shape or modes, then you need more. So generally, I just um, default to, you know, doing a few elements just so I can get like a, a reasonable deflected shape. The, the deflection at the tip of the beam will still be accurate. It's just the interstitial intermediate deflection of like the actual shape of the beam will not be accurate. So um, for this really long one, I think we can do six that's generally a good, and then for these really small ones, we can just do, you know, four, whatever. Um, it doesn't matter a ton. Again, the the number of elements does not affect the uh, the answer that you're going to get. So let's just go ahead and. mesh this up. So right now we're just doing mesh sizing and increase to give us the number of elements on the edge that we want. And then we're going to go to mesh geometry curve, select our 
Oops, that's not the right one. Select our curves here. Um, and then this one, I'm going to select them separately because it might try to combine them at that node. And actually, maybe that's fine. Yeah, let's do that. So make sure I have the right one. You can see all the nodes pop up, the little dots here. Hit OK. And then I want aluminum beam tube 2.1 by 0.05. Good. Hit OK. Orientation vector. So we're doing um, tubes, right? Uh, a circle. So it has the same properties in every direction on the section. If you're doing something like a square or an I-beam or a C-channel, of course, uh, your, you know, your beam has a direction. So essentially, this element orientation defines the Y vector. But essentially, we don't really care about that because it's a circle. So where our Y is, is not super, super relevant. Um, it, if you have significant bending, where you recover data could be relevant. You want to try to recover data in the highest possible stress location. But um, for, for now, you know, we're just doing stretch and tension compression in this minimally constrained system. So uh, anyways, that has created 26 elements. And if we turn on thickness, we can see them. Let's update our colors here. Um, what colors did I use on this guy? Blue for the tank, green, and then purple, and then a different shade of purple for the taper. So let's do that. We can leave the tank blue. We can change this guy to... Oops. We went to edit. Um, let's do a green color. And then you don't have to change your, your property colors. I just prefer to... Um, especially once we change the, the thickness of this guy here, you'll, it's good to visualize your different thicknesses on your plate models at a glance. So we'll change this guy to a purple. That looks good. Okay, uh, then let's copy this. And what did I use for the taper? 0.75. Okay, so let's edit to 0.75x.05. And then we're going to hit tapered beam and then go shape NB. So change shape and we'll do radius of 0.375. Okay. And okay, now we have a tapered beam, which we'll use in a second, but let's also do our end cap. And I think I went with quarter inch titanium for this. 0.25 thick. And let's do edit, change our thickness to 0 0.25. Now let's go Modify, update elements, property ID. Let's do the beams first. So we want tapered ends. And I think, I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, oh, missed one. I think these, actually I'll taper them. Um, Yeah, I think we're going to leave this guy untapered. This will be like, like I said, it'll be like a clevis lug that hooks up to this pin. And this guy is, of course, going to be our, our fixed connection between the beams and the solid elements here. So let's hit OK. And then Control G to regenerate. And we have all of our tapers. Some of them are backwards. So let's go to our element selection. And we can just swap around the nodes to get everything oriented in the correct direction. Edit, 
six and five. So I'm just swapping like the, you know, a beam element is uses two nodes to define one and the other end. So essentially to get the taper to turn around, I'm just swapping the two nodes. There we go. That looks pretty good. Uh, let's also update the color just for, for dramatic flare. So now you can see it's slightly different. And then let's also, while we're here, what color should we make the end cap here? How about like an orange? Okay, so now let's update our end cap. So I think what we're going to do to make this clear is we want to turn off our elements here. We want to delete the surfaces that don't have elements associated with them. And that'll help us a lot in the future when we're doing our, our loads. Let's go delete model, uh, sorry, geometry surface. And now you can see we have two surfaces here, seven and 233. We just want to delete seven. Um, I know it's that that's the one we want to delete because it's an, a lower number. So here we can see we've automatically selected something in the 200s. So there we go. We want to delete the lower number because that's what we imported. And then there we go. Okay, you delete four selected surfaces. Okay, and you can see, of course, four surfaces deleted, and we still have a surface here and all of our elements. So that was successful. Now, let's go ahead and update these two. So let's go to modify, update elements, property ID, on surface two, three, and then we'll go around to the other side, two, three, hit this button to make sure, make sure we have all the elements like do we want, hit okay, change it to quarter inch, and now you can see we have thickness on too, so you can see it's updated automatically to show much thicker, and it's also the new color. Okay, so uh, we can turn off field edges if we want, so we don't have to see the glob of lines everywhere. Now we have pretty much all of our beams, plates, and solids meshed. Turn off thickness, and you can see this is just how like, like beam elements are represented when you don't have thickness on, they're just lines. So two more kind of main steps. Um, we need to set up all of our connections because essentially right now nothing is connected. Uh, if we were to run an analysis on this, the sphere is not connected to any of the struts and the struts are not connected to the tripod here. So essentially what we're gonna do is um, connect everything up and I'll, I'll do one or two struts live here but some of them I'm going to do off camera just for the purpose of expediency. So let's start with the tripod here. So essentially we're going to press in a ball joint here. So we want to put a node right where our ball joint is going to rotate. So the, if I do, where is it? Inspect select our plane here that I placed at the center. So this is 21.375 to that surface. And if we want to measure, oops, hit construct. Uh, we want to measure to this surface is 20.375. So it's an inch. So we want um, 0.375 plus 0.5 is going to be 0.875, just wanted to check. <laughs> um, so essentially 20.875 is where we want to place a node. 
right here. So we're going to go over to the connections layer. So we were putting stuff in the right thing. Did I put the struts in the right layer? I did. That's surprising. <laughs> Let's uh, model a node. And now we can just place a node anywhere, right? You don't need geometry to make elements in nodes in Femap. So we're going to place it at 20.875 is what we said. And you can see I don't have nodes on, but there's now a node floating here. Maybe it'll help if I turn the tank off. So now we have a node right uh, where we want the center of our ball joint to be. So let's now connect that to our tripod here. So we're going to go to model element, type, change it to rigid. There are two types of rigid elements. RBE2 fully rigidizes um, all of the nodes that it's attaching, and RBE3 is an interpolation element, which means that it does not rigidize anything at all, and the stiffness of the, the node in the center, the dependent node, which will be this guy, is inherited based on the the, the, the stiffness of um, essentially the nodes that you've selected. So I'm going to select RBE3 for this purpose. Um, in, in reality, there is going to be a little bit of stiffening happening by the, the ball joint when you place it in, because it's going to be like a steel cage that you're pressing in here. But essentially, I'm just going to um, for now, leave that separate um, and just model this as a uh, interpolation connection. So dependent node, you can also create a new node at the center, which we'll do in a little while for some other connections. Um, but we just want to select this one that we just created and then nodes method on surface. Actually, before we do that, we want to make sure for uh, RB3s, we want to leave rotation control off. Um, a lot of times you can run into errors and issues um, when connecting like nodes to RB3s with rotation RX, RY, RZ control on. Especially, I think the, the problem from my experience comes when you have mid side nodes connected to RB3s with rotation. So just make sure you leave those off. Um, and then OK, and OK, and it defaults to white. I don't like setting them to white. I generally like to put these as like a pink color. Um, and so now you can see it's essentially connected every node to the center node, and the stiffness of the center node is um, inherited by the stiffness of all the nodes we have selected here. So there's that. Um, we also want to go ahead and connect this up to the fuel tank. So if we turn off connectors for a second, turn on the tank, we want to place a node directly on the, the fuel tank. So let's do model node and I, I think it was 19.875, but I should probably just check just to be sure. Um, oops, I'm still in the measure tool. Edit sketch. Yes, 19.875. So let's do model node. And we'll say 19.875. And that has created a node, which I think is actually going to be on top of another node. Node 1888 created. Turn on filled edges. Yeah, so it's we're right in the center. That's OK. Um, let's do model element. And just for the purpose of this side, we'll We'll also use an RBE3 to give this a nice big, oops, is that what we wanted? Actually, let's type in 18, okay, it's 188.888. And then nodes method, actually, let's not do method. So let's just 
shift select these nodes. So now we have a nice big pad and then it did select stuff on the back side. So we're going to go to remove shift select that to take those out. Now important that you also remove the 188888 and then hit more. So make sure you don't have your node that you selected for the center selected in the independent nodes or it won't work. And yeah, there we go. Hit OK. And it didn't show up because I have connectors off. And I forgot again to set the color. Let's do pink. Okay, and now we want to connect these with a spring. So I'm going to go to element property type, spring damper. So springs are very often used to express bolted joints. Essentially, you can calculate a stiffness of a bolted joint and uh, essentially abstract away the whole joint to just a spring element. And as long as you get the stiffness right, then your, your, your finite element model will be accurate. So there are tools that you can use to calculate bolted joint stiffness. For now, uh, especially in minimally constrained models where stiffness doesn't play an important part in the uh, load distribution, it doesn't actually matter a ton, uh, but still, you know, it's best to fill this out with the appropriate stiffness. But for now, I'm just going to use some approximations. So this is going to be a three degree of freedom connector. So essentially degrees of freedom, one, two, three. That's what we were talking about before. These are translational. So if this is a ball joint, if this is a ball joint or a rod end, essentially it, it can't allow translation but rotation um, is, is free. And I do add a little bit of stiffness, like 50 compared to what is this like 5 million, just because in, if you have actually zero in those numbers, then sometimes, uh, well, well, first of all, in real life, it's not actually zero because there's friction in the ball joint, but also it helps um, with minimally constrained models. Sometimes if like there's one solution and only one, then uh, the the solver sometimes thinks or like will, will give you errors that the model is unconstrained and just adding a tiny bit of stiffness helps um, and it doesn't affect the results much at all and if anything makes it more accurate by representing rod end stiffness and you know helps the solver not throw errors that the model is unconstrained. So title and the best way to check that you've done it right. Uh, is always to check the deform shape because the deform shape will will tell you, you know, what the constraints are doing essentially. So, anyways, we're going to change this to three doff connector. Oops, connector. Hit OK, and uh, while we're here, might as well make. Uh, we want a five doff connector, and. We want stiffness to be um, so essentially we want stiffness to be high in every direction except one dot five so this is like our scissor joint you can only open and close it you can't uh, rotate it in the other directions and we'll, we'll use that here um, okay so let's go ahead and connect this guy up. So model element property 3 doff connector nodes here to here. Now if we just hit OK, that's going to create our spring element. Let me turn off rigids here. So you can see here's our spring element. And essentially, the, the rotation point of the element is at where, where like the little spring symbol is. 
So right now our ball joint is rotating about this, which is not where we want it. So before when I was running this model, the rotation point is here. The strut is, you know, coming in here. So there's an offset between the strut force vector and the rotation point. So essentially the, the whole tripod was getting twisted and it was having like, you know, thousands and thousands of PSI of stress um, when it should be, you know, relatively, you know, I mean, it's, it's in the thousands of pounds for load, but it's, you know, should be tension or compression going straight to the ball joint here. And that's because it was twisting the whole thing because the rotation center wasn't set properly. So under offsets, what you want to do is do location and then zero, and then that'll put the offset location all the way at the, the, the first node. So you can see the, the little symbol moved back to here. So now we have that set correctly. Okay, so now let's do our five DOF connector. So for this guy, I think we can probably use new node at center. Let's start off though with um, model, actually we'll do modify move by before we do that we need to measure so we want to get the vector so we, we want to essentially move the node along the vector of the strut so we're going to go to tools measure distance between nodes and the vector should just be like 0.707 I, I think um, but Let's just get the yeah so it's it's equal because this is a you know it's going off at 45 degrees but just for the purpose of this exercise if we didn't have it, it you know if we didn't know the direction of the strut this is how you get it but anyways um so let's go modify move by node and then we'll move this guy back move along vector and we want to say zero 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 and then negative two point eight two eight two point eight two eight and uh oops sorry it should actually be zero negative and then two point eight two eight and oh i should have done locate length uh so this is the vector and then our length will be um however far we want to move the node so if we want to do like 0 0.5 should be okay so now you can see it's moved the the, the node back. So we now want to add our 5 DOF connector. So let's turn off. Actually, before we do that, let's do mesh. Sorry, um, model element type rigid. And we'll, now we're going to use new node at center. And independent will be. these guys hit OK and I keep forgetting to change the color before so now we have our rigid here and we use new node at center to just drop to a node right at the center for us now if we turn off our solid we can see we have our beam element right here turn on thickness so it's easier to see and we have our rigid connection to our solids so we're going to go to model element type spring damper and let's connect 
this guy and this guy. And property will be five da vector. Now, of course, our vector is is important. So we want um, our so we set degree of freedom five to be low, to be almost zero. So essentially, the that's the y direction, and this is what orientation determines the y direction. So we want to set this vector in the direction that we want the stiffness to be low, which if it's rotating around this axis, then um, we want that vector. So let's do 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 0, 0. So essentially our, our vector is just in the x direction, and then hit OK. Uh, and then offsets, we want to do, again, we want it to rotate about the center here, so let's do 0. And now it's created our damper. So um, you can kind of see the process here of connecting all this stuff up. Uh, let's do, um, I'll do this end, and then we'll do this end together, and then I'll do the rest off screen and jump back in. So let's, um, actually, I think maybe this one's better because I'll do that off screen. I'll do this one because you can see uh, the process. So let's start up here. We're going to, let's turn off thickness so it's easier to see. And we'll go to tools, check, uh, or sorry, measure distance between nodes here to here. And now we have dx, dy, dy, and dz, or x1, x2, and x3, and sorry, the, <laughs> the numbers are at the bottom of the screen, and I have a, a microphone in front of me, and it's covering the, the numbers, so I have to like strain a little bit to see it, but um, for here, we want to actually model a new node, because we don't have a rigid here, so we're going to go to model node, and then methods will be on node, Hit OK, and it created node 265. Then we'll go to modify move by node. Um, we want to make sure we don't select 265. That's the one we just made. Hit OK, move along vector. Our length will be 0 0.5, and our base is 0, 0, 0, and our toward is 714, 3.5. 333 3, 3, 3, and 3.333. That's essentially what I had selected before. Um, and I hope I did this in the right direction. Let's find out. I did. Okay. So now you can see we added a node here and then we moved the element, the node with the element back by half an inch. And now we can add model element. Make sure we select our three degree of freedom. This guy to this guy. And then uh, our, our vector doesn't matter, but our location, again, we want to be at zero. So it's rotating around the correct point. Okay, and then we'll just do this last one live together. Um, because, oops. We want to, oh, I think I turned off the solids. Okay. So this guy, um, and, okay, this, this green is a bit blinding in my opinion. I, I think we should try to mute it a little bit. Let's see here. Palette. Is there like a... That's better. That's less blinding. Okay, so let's go model element type rigid and new node at center. Nodes on surface Okay, and okay, I'm gonna remember this time. Once I set it there once, it'll stay like that, but I, I just keep forgetting. <laughs> On surface. Okay, now we have rigids and change this guy to be pink as well. Okay, now we're gonna make a new element uh, copy. We'll call this a six off connector and set this to 5e6 so this is essentially just a, a stiff connection 
um, with some you know, stiffness in the six directions between two nodes and we'll go to model element and we'll say spring damper sixth off connector so this does not allow a ton of rotation in either direction okay okay uh, so I actually did that a little bit wrong but that's okay what we wanted to do was create a new node here first model node put that there so 268 and let's edit this element and we'll replace 56 and 55 let's see what it is 55 so let's replace 55 with 268 so I just replaced the, the node that this element was using and now we can do modify move by node 268 again hit more move along vector right and then we want to use the same vector except this time we're going to go in the opposite direction so we're going to reverse it so we're going to go positive 4.714 and then negative 3.333 negative 3.33 and then the length is 0 0.5 and that has moved it up in the direction of the strut which is important uh, and then we'll go model element this is a rod end so you know just a ball joint so we're going to connect it like this and then the location we're going to set to zero and there we go so that's all connected up so um let's also do this and then i swear i'll do the rest off screen because <laughs> i think this is somewhat important so like i said there's a lot of different ways you can connect these two tubes um let me show thickness uh so there's a lot of different ways you can connect these two tubes you could just put them against each other and weld. you could rivet through it um you could you know use bolts and flanges uh there's a lot of different ways we're going to like i said for now just abstract that away and do a just a, a connection between the two and we'll, we'll use an rb3 so we don't stiffen the whole tube artificially so we'll go model element rigid and we'll say node is this guy independence are on surface all these guys hit okay and now you can see it's actually defaulted to pink because i said that there are ones which is good um okay so now that's all connected up so hopefully you can kind of see here how we're, we're building out connections with with springs and rigids this is how you connect your different pieces of the finite element model together so like i said i have to finish um these struts and then i'll do these as well essentially doing the same technique that i used for back here just adding a node moving the element or moving the node with the element and then uh, adding in our spring so i'll do that and i'll be back in just a second okay everybody we're back and i just went ahead and did the exact same technique for all of our beams here and um i will also went ahead and just connect these guys up to the elements uh so you can see edit here 271 that node is shared by all these elements 271 so that's all connected up um, and essentially our our model is now and again remember from before we just abstracted away this tripod end to uh you know just lines um, in reality we would model that but essentially we're all connected up so we are officially in the home stretch here uh, and the the final steps before we run our analysis are to set up our constraints and loads so constraints, quite easy. Um, we're going to call this uh, fixed at, uh, this is our, like our, our lunar module structure, so I'll just call it fixed at LM. And then we'll open up that and constraint definitions nodal. 
So this is quite easy. We've already used all of our three dot connectors. So we just want to select, let's actually, to make it extra easy, let's turn off struts. Uh, and then we just want to select all of our endpoints here. Two, so there should be six. Um, where did that just go? Maybe this has not made it easier, but that's okay. <laughs> There's four. Five, six. Hit okay. Uh, so we're just going to hit fixed here, and this will constrain all of our translations and rotations, which is what we want because we have springs. Um, technically, the springs there were optional, but I prefer to do them because then you can uh, output forces from forces and moments on your spring. So um, there we go. Now the constraint showed up. So you don't need those, but I, I greatly prefer to have springs. So there's our constraint on node. Uh, so let's add some loads now. So we're going to add two loads, of course, well, three technically. So the first one is going to be um, fuel pressure. And we'll do load definitions. We want to do actually elemental. Uh, and then enter elements to select. Actually, let's do not elemental. Let's do on surface, which is still an elemental load. So enter surfaces to select. So um, essentially, this is why we deleted the other stuff before. So now we can just correctly select the surfaces. And basically, we just want to select all of our tank sur surfaces here to add pressure load to. Hit the show selected button, make sure we get everything selected. We do. Hit OK. Now we want a pressure load. And the pressure, uh, if you remember back in our propulsion data website, uh, proof pressure, which is essentially what they they test to. So the, the actual pressure um, experienced will be less but uh, we're just going to go with the proof pressure for this analysis of 333. And then we'll hit OK. Um, and you can see it's the wrong direction. We don't, we don't have a vacuum inside in 333 PSI pushing the sphere in. We have pushing the sphere outward. So we're going to go edit load and we'll just change this to negative. So uh, we can see we have 333 PSI aimed in the correct direction. And just to kind of visualize that, um, you know, think of an inch, like a, a, a square the size of an inch, and then 333 pounds um, just like sitting on top of like all of its force into just that like tiny little inch. Uh, square. So that's like kind of how much pressure we're dealing with and that's on every square inch of, of this tank trying to rip it apart. Um, and obviously helium tanks can be more as well. They can be like in the thousands of PSI. So definitely dealing with high pressure. Um, okay, so this is all obviously quite distracting so we can turn off our loads visualization here um, and constraints as well just to simplify what we're looking at. And we'll go ahead and uh, add a new load. Actually, not yet. So we want to add um, acceleration from the fuel tank, basically like the, the mass of the fuel inside. So for that, let's turn off everything except the fuel tank. So when, when the spacecraft accelerates, um, something called ullage happens. So uh, essentially, you know, the, the fuel is just in the tank um, in like a, a rest position, basically. And when the spacecraft starts to accelerate, it gets pushed towards the bottom of the tank. Um, and, and actually spacecraft do that intentionally. They push, they, they, like I think in the case of the lunar module, they fire the little RCS, the reaction control thrusters that they use for turning the spacecraft for like a few seconds and then ignite the main engine. 
and that's to make sure that the the fuel is uh you know oledged towards the bottom so basically resting on the bottom so we want to just apply our fuel tank load to the bottom so if we go to model element um where is it uh, we went oops we went rigid hit okay uh, and now let's just we don't have to be super exact here um we're going to go with on surface and then let's just select like the bottom third or something like that oops we did not want on surface i apologize let's select on element or just id and then let's just select like the bottom third so essentially that's what we're saying our uh, fuel is going to be you know hitting against so this of course is not quite exact and every time acceleration changes direction uh, the fuel is going to be you know pressing against a different side but for this model it works um, and then we'll just use new node at center and we'll hit OK and now if we turn on our connectors and um, go ahead and hide the tank you can see we have this massive RBE3 which again does not stiffen uh, the uh, fuel tank at all it just adds connections so let's turn off our ridges oops um, so actually before we do that let's can we um, turn off the tank here select our rigid and we want node 276 that's the center of this guy so let's um, let's go ahead and do a new load we'll call this um, fuel tank acceleration and load definitions this time we want nodal so we're going to do 276 hit more okay um, and so now we want just a force and we know we want to force downward um, but what force should we do well I found that uh, there are total fuel 2,000 and 11 pounds and then I found this website uh, history.nasa.gov that has ascent data for Apollo 11 and you can see here um, S1C stage burn which is basically uh, the the Saturn V rocket first stage you can see maximum total inertial acceleration um, Apollo 7 is a different vehicle that's Saturn 1B which is 4.28 but the rest of these are 3.96, 3.85, 3.92, 3.94, Apollo 11 was 3.94, um, pretty much everything is just about 4. So 4 G's of acceleration on the Saturn V first stage, and there's other accelerations here, this is stage 2, uh, it's roughly 2 G's max. Um, the, the first burn of the next stage is like you know less than a g and the second burn is like one and a half g's so essentially four g's is our maximum and in reality there's going to be other accelerations there's like vibration environments um probably some lateral accelerations in there but uh, for now we'll just assume that we have our four g's and two thousand pounds of fuel so we're just going to call this negative eight thousand um now another way you could do it is uh and, and actually you probably should do it this way but for the purposes of the video um i'm just going to do it this way is add an add a mass element where the fuel would be and then uh, make sure all your masses are correct on your materials and then you can just add an acceleration of four g's but just for simplicity's sake i'm just going to add negative eight thousand pounds which is two thousand pounds times four g's um so uh, we have that added now, and if I 
turn on my rigid here and then turn on loads it should show uh, I might be like hidden inside there um, there it is negative 8,000 so let's turn that back off and one last load which will actually be instead of doing standard we want to do Nastra and load combination and we'll call this um, pressure plus acceleration hit OK um, so now this is a different symbol and if we go to show loaded entities oh sorry oops and if we go to reference sets then we can add both of these so now essentially we have fuel tank acceleration and fuel pressure in the the same load here that we can apply at the same time hit okay okay now let's go ahead and analyze so let's go manage on the analysis and we'll hit new and we'll call this uh fuel tank analysis um leave the program as SimCenter Nastran and analysis type static. There are others here, um, but for now we're just doing a static analysis. And we'll say um, this you can leave as is. Portion of mile to right entire model. Um, that's good if you have uh, accelerations and you want to do weight mass to set your Acceleration scale, right? Um, but most of the stuff we can just leave as is. And um, geometry checks, if you want. And after trying to do the geometry check like we did before. Um, so we can add in our uh, all of our tetra checks if we want, like determinant uh, for Jacobians and all that stuff. But leave that off for now. Weight and ground check. You can select these and it'll basically make sure your model's constrained appropriately. Um, this all outputs to like print files that maybe I can show another time. Master requests and conditions. I, I always turn these off. I don't prefer to use master requests and conditions. And then this is just what we want to output. So displacement, load, constraint force, we want those. Um, force and stress. And then let's also do total strain and elastic strain. Um, I rarely use those except for composites, but it's still in a good habit to, to make sure you're selecting those so you get strains as well. And then hit OK, and we're going to go to uh, where it says no cases defined, hit multi set, and it's a fixed set LM, those are constraints, and then here are our three loads fuel pressure, fuel tank acceleration, and then fuel plus acceleration. So let's. Um, add those and um, so this is either going to work or it's going to error out so let's see if we did anything wrong and hit the analyze button so it should be fairly quick um, what do we have 35,000 elements uh, should take less than a minute should be just about finished now yep so it took 36 seconds to finish so not too bad and we didn't get any errors which is good so everything is all constrained properly um, I think I wrote this down what were the the pitfalls I encountered while prepping uh, yeah left rotational control an RBE 3 talked about that uh, that's like the R, RX RYZ on the elements didn't give some rotational stiffness to the three DOF C bushes I talked about that uh, and then didn't set offset of tripod on the RB3, and I talked about that. So those are the errors I encountered while prepping for the video. Um, and looks like we don't have any new ones, which is good. So first thing I always like to do is go to the deform model, and it defaults to percent of model, which is like I, my mind always gets confused with that. So I just set it to actual deformations, and then you can control the scale. Um, so this is our fix that LM plus our pressure case. Let's turn on the struts so you can see them and set our deformations to 10. And we can also animate it. And that looks correct, right? Um, we have an acceleration 
and our tank is moving. We can see our, our struts are, are moving as you'd expect them. Um, so everything looks pretty good. Uh, I said at the beginning of the video that I would show you the pressure. That was um, the load push the pressure, but let's just do the pressure here. Turn on the deform shape and let's do something really high like 100. Um, okay, and then we'll do this guy. So you can see uh, exactly what I was talking about, right? So the, the tripod's fixed. That's not going to move. Uh, this is way too fast, isn't it? Uh, okay, so I'll set it to 16 frames, so now it's much slower. Um, but another thing that it does that I don't like is it, it does it reverses the deformation, which doesn't make a lot of sense for a fuel tank. Uh, so I like to do linear full. Um, so now it's only doing the pressure. So you can see here exactly what I was talking about. Um, the tripod is fixed in space. This cannot move. And as the tank pressurizes, it expands. And uh, essentially, the strut will move outward, uh, like bend about the axis created between the two struts. You can see that's working exactly as you'd expect. And then of course this one swings outward. And again, keep in mind, this is a hundred X deformation. So you can still barely see it. Um, maybe if I do five, yeah, so you can see it a little bit better now. Um, and you can see the struts moving, but again, uh, you know, the 100 X deformations really show you exactly what's going on. And if these were two, you know, tripods, if we just mirrored this tripod on the other side, essentially the, this tank expansion would be fighting against our structure, which is definitely something that we don't want. Um, and then if we want, we can, this is just, um, the, the fuel tank load. Um, so let's see here. Let's do okay. So that's our fuel tank load pushing the fuel tank down. Um, everything looks like it's behaving as it should. And then here's a combination of pressure expanding as well as the um the the fuel tank load. So everything looks like it should. Our deform shape looks correct. Everything's behaving as we expect it to. So let's jump into looking at the stress. Now you can um, look at individuals, like individual stress. So we're going to say like plate top von Mises, turn on our contours, and then also it defaults to magenta. So I want to turn magenta off. Um, hit no magenta. Uh, and then also we want data conversion, no average centroid only. Um, and then we also want to turn off continuous colors. There we go. That's much better. Um, and then let's say max threshold. Let's set it to 60,000. Okay, so um, here is our plate top von Mises stress. Uh, so, of course, when you have a plate element, you have a top and a bottom because, you know, you set, this, you set the thickness in the program, so you need to look at both of them. Um, in a lot of cases, they're similar. In the case of bending, they can be very different. Um, so we can look at individual outputs, and then to see, like, the solid stress, we have to go to, uh, where is it, solid von Mises stress right here. So we set this down to like 20,000. We can see what our stress state looks like in this. Um, but a lot of times, if you just want to look at it all together, you can go to model output process and then envelope one or more selected output vectors, envelope all selected vectors, select output to process. Uh, if we select all three of these, then actually let's just do pressure plus acceleration. Um, then, well, you, you can select multiple, but generally if it's a superposition, then it's going to be um, 
you know, the, the, the addition of the two is going to be higher, but let's, let's leave it as all three. Um, so we want to do, um, where is it? Beam and where is it? Uh, here it is. Nope. There we go. Beam and A max combined stress. Beam and B max combined stress. So this is the two ends of the beam for stress. Uh, that's all envelope those two. Um, plate top von Mises stress. So that's the top of the plate. And then plate bottom von Mises stress. So that's the, the top and bottoms of the plate. And then finally we want uh, solid von Mises stress um, right here. And then if we hit OK, it'll show us everything that we're going to envelope. And then OK again. And now we can visualize all of our stresses um, at one time. So you can see, uh, let's just start with our struts. Of course, the fuel tank is red entirely because we've um, set the, the stress that we're looking at to 20,000. And of course, our fuel tank has more than 20,000 PSI stress in it. But anyways, let's just look at our struts. So it makes sense. Um, if we have our load downward, right? So essentially we have a triangle here. So if we're trying to push this triangle downward, the the top one, the top strut is going to be in um, tension and the bottom one is gonna be in compression. That checks out, so that's why this is zero because it's in compression and we just did max stress. Um, let's actually hop over to, uh, we'll go beam, maybe this will help a little bit. Where is it? Beam and a axial force. And let's do automatic. Um, okay, so now you can see uh, it, it's still blue, these bottom ones, but now I've changed the scale. So it's negative 4,000. I mean, do F6 and we'll do, uh, this is another thing, post-processing. We want to do legend and then it's set to contour colors. Like who can read this yellow? If you use UV, view colors, it changes them to black. So now you can see we have uh, numbers that we can actually read. So blue in this case is negative 4,000 and red is 5,000. So, so that makes sense, right? So we have tension in this strut. Um, we have a, a load applied downward, which is going to try to pull this strut and then in return push this strut as it reacts out that load. And then the exact same thing here, we have uh, you know, four or 5,000 pounds of tension in this upper strut and then compression in this lower strut as it reacts the fuel pushing it down. So that totally makes sense. And then the other two struts are basically unloaded. They're in like the, the zero-ish range, which also checks out because we don't have any loads trying to spin the tank. So this guy is pretty much um, just kind of holding it there without taking much load. Um, and then if we had loads that were uh, kind of left and right here, then this strut would come into play uh, because this is what holds it in the left and right direction. But since we just did a downward force, this strut is unloaded. So, um, you know, I also encourage you to check out your, your forces for sure in your struts when you have minimally constrained models and just kind of go through it and, you know, make sure everything makes sense to you. And to me, this all looks like it checks out. Um, so that was a quick aside. Let's hop back over to our stress and it went back. Let's set it to how about 50,000. So that's why we can see we have, um, no stress zero in all these. And then the, the struts here have, you know, color, they have a certain amount of stress in them. Uh, and then the tapers do have higher stress than the, the non tapers, which also checks out. Um, and, uh, so let's zoom in here, lower this down 20,000. Um, so let me hide the fuel tank. So this looks pretty good. Um, again, we're, we're getting almost no load through this lug. Um, if we had a significant side load, then this would be loaded 
much more um, and we could check out how that looks um, you know while we're here shall we just try that I didn't actually do this on my prep analysis um, but might as well see what it looks like um, let's do a I won't add the bother adding the fuel here let's um, copy this guy we'll call it fuel tank lateral acceleration and we'll say our load definitions will be um, edit load and we'll do a which direction we want we want in the x direction so let's say let's just do 2,000 pounds in the x direction and see how this does I have no idea um, how it's gonna look because like I said I, I didn't do it before um, and, and again also keep in mind that uh, I, I'm just doing this kind of quick and dirty to to show it um, we would need to update and add a different rigid body um, because right now our, our rigid is you know at the bottom where the fuel would be pressing but we would need to update it into whatever direction the acceleration is but that's okay I just want to show some load going through the uh, the side cross member here so let's um, go ahead and analyze this guy oh I'm almost out of memory um, no uh, I, I don't think I'm almost out of memory yeah 17 out of 32 maybe it's memory allocated I don't know but anyways um, so yeah we'll see how this works <laughs> like I said no clue Okay, looks like we're almost done here. Okay, let's start with checking out the deformation. Um, oh, I was like, did I do something wrong? But I always do this by accident. I deform the model by the stress. Um, okay, we want fuel tank lateral acceleration, and this is still at 100, so let's just do one. Let's do maybe 10, we can visualize it. There we go. Okay, so that looks like it's it's definitely moving in the direct correct direction, and this is probably going to pick up quite a bit of load. Uh, so let's then take a look at our, um, we want solid on Mises stress. And what do we got here? Okay, so fairly reasonable actually. Um, we have uh, a decent amount of stress kind of around the root here, but Overall, it's it's not too bad. Um, I, I think we probably have a bit of twisting going on here. Um, I would imagine because it seems like we have some stress coming in here uh, around the bottom. So it, we might not have set the strut to go perfectly through the rotation center. So we're essentially twisting the tripod um, and, and twisting this strut in return. So our, our scissor joint is basically uh, taking some, some twisting load and trying to react that which is not what we want so um you know we, we probably need to update this struct vector to go uh, just by looking at this it's probably not going through the center um so we're getting some twisting here but you know i think it looks fairly reasonable uh and now like if we compare that to just our other one where we have you know our our load coming in through here stress straight through here and some around here um, in this case you know we have no stress on these lugs and then if we do a lateral acceleration then we have stress on those lugs and then we can also show um, where is it beam and a axial force uh, we can see uh, we still have it set to 20,000 so nothing's going to show up um, yeah now you can see we're putting negative 2,000 um, 
and let's do max min threshold so you can see there's a real number there do 1000 and negative 5 4000 sure um, so now you can see we're putting you know something like a thousand pounds negative a thousand pounds through the strut which is exactly what we expect we expect um, if we push the tank to the right here we're going to get compression in the strut so that checks out um, okay let's that was a brief distraction but hopefully it was cool to see the the new uh, or the strut loaded um, this is saying deformation output vector does not exist because I switched to the envelope and I don't have translations for my envelope. Um, let's put this back to zero and we'll put this to, actually let's change this to max threshold, negative zero. Um, and we'll put this to 50,000. Okay, so we saw this. Uh, this checks out. All looks good. Um, oops, too low. So you can see everything looks good here. We tested the lugs, looks good. Um, you know, everything's working as we'd expect. Um, let's hop into the fuel tank here. So um, you can see if we we have uh, our, our actual titanium strength is like 120,000. So, oops, that's, that's 1.2 million. Um, so we do have some red elements down here. That's debatable whether or not that's, that's real at the rigid, but by and large, this tank is like reasonably loaded. Um, and you can also see since we're pushing it down or kind of bending it, you can see there's like some stress, some higher stress. Let me set this back to like 60,000. Uh, there's some higher stress down here as it's bending. Um, that makes sense. And some, some stress up here again, we're essentially bending the sphere around our mount points. Um, so that all looks like it checks out. And then uh, important always to do, you know, kind of like your gut checks, like I was doing before, making sure all the struts were being loaded in the correct direction, the deformed shape was correct, but it's also important to do like actual hand calculations. Um, so this is a pressurized sphere, which is like one of the simplest pressure vessels to calculate by hand. Um, so if we just uh, look at one of these elements in the bottom left. You can see, um, I'll like circle it on screen and maybe blow it up a little bit, but you can see our uh, stress is 41,600 PSI, right? So, so that's the, the stress we're calculating in the, the, the fuel tank, um, kind of far away from the mounts where it's just more or less the pressure. And if we hop over to my calculations here, um, this is a very simple calculation for uh, a pressure vessel sphere. It's just the stress sigma here equals the pressure, which is 333, times the radius, which is 20 inches, divided by 2 times the thickness. So we have 333 times 20 inches. Probably should have put units here, but Femap is also unitless, so um, it works. So you can see when we calculate this out, we have... 41,625, um, which is, you know, within a few PSI, we have uh, far away from the hole, we have 41,834. So we're within, you know, a few hundred PSI out of 40,000. Uh, so our, our model matches uh, what we'd expect very well, right? Um, you know, a, a few hundred or like generally if you're doing hand calculus, you want it to be within five to ten percent of like matching between your hand calculations and your model, and we're within like you know less than a hundred or so psi. And actually, I just realized there was I was looking at the bottom here where we have load applied from our um, our uh, OLEDGE, like the the interpolation rigid. Um, if we look up at the, up at the top here, we're at forty one thousand six hundred ish. And we're like literally within a few PSI of the theoretical hand calculation, which is great. So um, we know that we, we did our pressure correctly and it's accurate. Um, so yeah, that's always good to see when your, your hand calculations very, very closely match um, what you what you'd expect. Um, 
if your hand calculations are drastically different. Like if I got 30,000 PSI hand calc and the model said 40, um, then where, you know, you, you definitely have to dig in and see, is my hand calc right? Is my hand calc approximating the system right? And if it is, then what have I gotten wrong about my finite element model? Um, so definitely, uh, you know, hand calcs, what you learn in class are, are important steps to verifying what you'd expect. Um, so anyways, I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I think I hit on all the points I wanted to. Actually, before we jump off, I do want to show, uh, if we go to list output results to data table, uh, and if we select like, um, let's just select like this load and we'll do X, Y, and Z force and select this element. Um, and now you can see what I was talking about before you can essentially like probe your forces and, and see what you got. So there's negative 4,000 pounds on this uh, C bush, which looks correct. So again, these C bushes are, are very helpful when you um, uh, output loads for all your fasteners and all your joints and everything. So, so anyways, I, I think we hit on all the points that we wanted to. Um, so I hope that, you know, you guys have enjoyed. Let me know if you have any feedback. Um, I'm not sure if my explanations were as clear as last time. Uh, hopefully, you know, in, in the first section of the video where I talked about all the the, the constraints and whatnot, but hopefully throughout the video and with the demonstration at the end here with the, the fuel pressure, um, it kind of made sense with, with what I was talking about. Um, but, you know, definitely let me know if there was anything confusing or that didn't make sense or that I didn't explain well. Um, you know, always open to, to feedback and uh, We'll be definitely making uh, more videos in the future on, on various space structures. Um, I think actually next one might be more of an aviation structure. I'm thinking about doing like a representative model of a wing on an airplane or something. Um, that could be fun. And then I'm also kind of working on a big project, uh, which I don't think I'm going to do live, but I'll, I'll like kind of record everything as I do it for like a time lapse type of deal, which is I'm hoping to put together uh, an analysis model of the whole Apollo capsule, like the, the command module structure, which I think could be a lot of fun. Um, so anyways, guys, uh, that's pretty much all I got. Um, let me know if you have any feedback or questions or, or confusion. Uh, and uh, I'll see you all next time. Thanks.